You know, it's pretty clear any time you pick up the, the gospel of John and you begin reading most anywhere in John's gospel, it becomes clear to you pretty, uh, pretty quickly that John's on a mission. John has something that he wants to accomplish in the words that are on the page. And what you find is that John employs a variety of, of narrative uh, techniques in order to, uh, to accomplish this. One of the things he does is he sort of uses uh, code words, if you will, or, or, or euphemisms, perhaps, to, to, to drive a point home. Sometimes uh, those, those, those euphemis <laughs> euphemisms come uh, from the lips of, of Jesus himself, at other times, um, John kind of adds them in as, uh, as sort of his own editorial comment in order to push the theme forward. One that you see uh, that's used throughout, uh, but certainly you'll recognize that's uh, in there today, is the, the, the use of the word hour, H-O-U-R, uh, as in time, as in a measure of, of time. Jesus speaks uh, in this passage about his hour having come. Now, sometimes, the, you know, these code words, if you will, they have, you know, they sound rather benign, uh, but, but more often than not, um, when, when you look at them a little more closely, they, they seem to almost have sort of a, a, a sinister uh, tone to them. As John um, recounts the ministry of, uh, of Jesus, um, the, the action uh, constantly focuses on two different things throughout his gospel. One is the miraculous signs that Jesus is showing to those around him. And then secondly, are constant clashes with the Jewish leaders over his ministry. And then, of course, the responses that come to those two areas um, are also uh, very diverse. One is that many are ready to, to crown him king. Um, the other is that many want to kill him. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum, certainly. But the reactions are kind of on a collision, collision course, on a chart, if you will. You know that at some point those lines are going to intersect and something bad is going to happen. As the uh, attention uh, tends to get focused on Jesus when uh, he's performing these miraculous signs, um, you, you see that he often in John's gospel sort of steps out of the limelight, out of the spotlight, and John says this happens, or even Jesus says this happens because his hour has not yet come. After he fed the 5,000, for example, the people wanted to crown him king, so he withdraws to a private place. When uh, he's teaching um, in, in, in the temple and he gets the religious uh, leaders all worked up and angry with him to the degree that they're ready to pick up rocks and stone him, he then sort of slips away. Jesus basically spends his entire time throughout John's gospel sort of zigzagging throughout, trying to dodge those who on the one hand want to, to crown him king and those who on the other hand want to kill him. But after he has uh, two really high-profile incidents, and they sort of come back to back, it seems that he's reached the point where he can no longer zig or zag. He can't do that fast enough in order to dodge the crowds. The first one was Lazarus. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then he darts into the wilderness. But then he comes back into public view, and he's hailed as king when he walks into Jerusalem. For chapter after chapter, month after month of Jesus' ministry, we find that he's avoided this, this collision of these two groups because, uh, as John reminds us, 
his hour has not yet come. But his entry into Jerusalem, I think, signals that all is about to change. The, uh, the trigger that sets everything in motion, Jesus says, is when some Greeks come to see him in this particular reading we have today. They're seeking an appointment with Jesus. Greeks who come from truly the other side of the empire. Um, they, they come, and, and that really signals to us as, as readers just how far word about this Jesus has spread. It's no longer just sort of local news, but news has spread internationally, if you will, about Jesus. So when these Greeks come uh, and ask for an audience with Jesus, when they ask to see Jesus, it's at this time that he knows instinctively is that his time has come, his hour has come. And he says this very directly. The hour has come. The hour has come, of course, is a code word. It's a code word that John employs that refers to the hour of Jesus' death. He knows that death is imminent, and he begins to talk about it at this point more and more. He knows if he keeps drawing attention to himself, he's going to get himself killed. I mean, he understands that. The more the crowds come to acclaim him, the more the religious leaders want to end his life. There could be a change of course for Jesus at this point, but time is, in fact, running out. He could pull back. He could try to smooth things over with the Pharisees. He could try to soften his message and perhaps live through it. You can tell in this reading that this has been heavy on his mind. His soul is troubled by the thought. He's considered his options. I mean, should he call upon the Father to save him from this hour? Now that the hour has come, should Jesus pull back and try to avoid it? Jesus knows he's got a choice that he needs to make at this point. He can save his life or he can be a savior, but he cannot do both. And in a rather euphemistic way, he declares his decision in this writing today. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. The purpose of a Savior is to give his life so that others can find true life. The, the purpose of a grain of wheat is to die so that more wheat can be produced. You know, when, when you first hear that, when, when we just, you know, read it from here in the aisle, uh, you know, I'm sure that the, the impact of those words probably didn't quite hit you. I mean, it probably seemed more like a, a 4-H project or, or, or something, this whole reference to wheat. But he's really talking here about laying down his very life, and he's made the decision at this point that he's going to do so. He's prepared to die. He speaks the same message with uh, two more phrases. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He says, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Those are code words. Those are code words that the death of Jesus is about to come. So, all right. What do we make of all of that for ourselves today? How do we make some use of that? Well, I think that this writing really relates to us very 
directly when we think about having perhaps a, a new view of what the suffering that we endure each day in, in our lives uh, it, it, it is worth. It, it, it provides us, I think, a new way of looking at our own options when suffering is one of the choices that we face. It's not a totally new view of suffering, but it's one that still, I guess, hadn't really caught on at Jesus' time, and it's probably caught on even less all these years later. He's saying here that suffering is not just something to be endured. He's saying that sometimes suffering is something to be embraced. It's a tough message for us to accept. It's a tough message when, you know, we've been taught all our lives that, you know, it's all about self-preservation and about avoiding pain. Even when the message is spoken clearly, it seems that we are kind of deaf to it, much as I think folks were 2,000 years ago. When Jesus announced his decision not to draw back from this hour that was to come, saying that he had come for a reason, this voice, this voice from heaven confirms it. Now, you'd think for all those people who were gathered there and heard that message, you know, you would think, what more could anyone possibly need than to hear God in heaven speak down and essentially say, Amen. Yes. But instead, they kind of scratched their heads and said to one another, D did you hear something? I don't know. I didn't. Did you? Maybe it was just thunder. Maybe it was thunder. Or maybe instead, it was just plain deafness to the voice of God. Or maybe more likely, it was deafness to certain words in God's vocabulary. That's probably what our real problem is today. It's still hard to have God's voice heard today when God uses words like death and loss and, and servanthood. Did you ever notice how, you know, most of the time when you, you talk to someone who's telling you about how they heard the voice of God today, it's always a very positive voice. It's always a, a voice that talks about how they might grow or acquire more or, or preserve what they have. But Jesus says that he had come to die and to give his life away when he says, unless a kernel of wheat. It's a message for all of us, even 2,000 years later, at least for those of us who wish to consider ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. He makes it clear that it's not just his tough decision that he's talking about here. He's talking about a decision that we need to face as well. The man who loves his life will lose it. The man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I would suggest to you that for each and every one of us in this room, there's something in our life that needs to die. I don't know what needs to die in your life, but this much I do know. There are choices that I think all of us must make. When we think of life or death issues, we always assume that the right answer is always to choose life. Jesus is asking us here to reframe that question entirely. Instead of seeing matters as life and death, he says to see them as self-preservation versus life-giving sacrifice. For some of us, that means saying perhaps no to a, a career in order to respond instead to a call. 
it might mean dying to self in order to save a marriage. Maybe it'll mean foregoing the the first-class luxuries of life in order to give financially to the expansion of the church so that we might reach others. Sometimes we have to suffer. Sometimes we may even have to die. But it should all be done to bring greater glory to God. For each of us, the hour has come.